Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash. Episode 331 for May 12th of 2016. Honda Ridgeline, the untruck truck. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Okay, Gary, you got to finish the line of the song. The stars at night, they sure shine bright. Deep in the heart of Texas. And, uh, why do I say that? Because <laughs> we're deep in the heart of Texas. That's right. And Today's if show... doing Yellow Roses, I'm way yeah, out yeah, of my yeah, league yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you got that at least, but uh, yeah, we're at uh, the media launch for the new Honda Ridgeline pickup truck just outside of San Antonio, Texas mm -hmm. at the, the ranch. I think that this is what, Rio Ceboyo or something like that? Something like that. My Spanish is not so good. Well, my Yours Spanish is, great. is very good, and I have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the closest I can translate that into is this is ranch onion, and I know that's not right. Could be. Who knows? Well, okay, we got to let everybody know we've got Jeff Conrad, Senior Vice President at the Honda Division, joining us right now to talk about the new Ridgeline. Jeff, and it's great to have you on the show here. Hey, it's great to be here. Glad to be able to spend some time with you guys. Okay, a couple of years ago, you guys had a pickup in your lineup, the Ridgeline did sort of okay, not too bad, but it never really set the world on fire. It went out of production, but you guys haven't given up. You've, you're back with a new pickup. What's it mean for Honda have a, to have a pickup in its lineup? Well, first, let me say the never give up. It was actually a very nice truck, and we had about 250,000 owners, 175,000 of them who still own the vehicle and are very loyal. But we are really excited about the new pickup. Uh, the new pr pickup breaks some new ground in today's market. You know, today's consumer is different uh, than, than in the past. They're looking for a, a vehicle that meets their everyday driving and hauling needs, but they want to do it without any of the, quote, traditional compromises to ride, handling, comfort, maneuverability. And we think the new Ridgeline serves that need just just great. So, so when you guys did the first one, you broke the mold in terms of what someone would perceive a pickup truck to be by going with the unibody. This one continues that, that approach. Is, is that what gives you this goodness that you just described in terms of ride and handling, in terms of fit and finish, in terms of NVH, in terms of uh, other attributes of the vehicle? Uh, Yes. Uh, <laughs> so what I mean by that, to expand on that, is, you know, it, people used to think of, well, if a pickup truck isn't body on frame, it's not really a serious pickup truck. Well, I would beg to differ. You know, the truck that uh, we're bringing to market into this all-new 2017 Ridgeline, uh, it is a unibody truck. But when you look at the rigidity that is built into this truck. If you look at the overall construction of this truck, you consider that it also has independent rear suspension. Uh, this vehicle is every bit as strong or stronger than any other truck in its class. And you'll see that, in, and the benefit of all that is you get a vehicle that doesn't bend and twist. You get a vehicle with the independent rear suspension that gives you great ride and handling and comfort. You also get quiet in the interior. So it's a truck that everybody meets mm -hmm. every, everybody's needs for driving, hauling, but it's also fun to drive. It's pleasant to drive. And, and the, talk about the class that you're competing in. Well, we're in the mid-size pickup class, so it's a, a mid-size quad cab vehicle. Uh, but the great thing about this is it breaks some new ground in there in terms of within that class, it has the biggest payload uh, or has the biggest bed of any of the vehicles out there. So it's five foot, four inches. So it's longer, it's wider than the competitors in that specific class. So uh, we, we think it's uh, gonna meet everybody's needs. Jeff, how do you think that whole segment's going to go? Uh, 
GM just jumped in with a Chevrolet and a GMC, the Colorado, the Canyon. Toyota just redid, refreshed uh, the Tacoma. Nissan's going to refresh its Frontier. You guys are getting in. I got to believe Ford and Ram have got to react to this and come in with trucks of their own. How big is this segment going to be? Well, I, I, I'm not going to guess at how big the segment will be, except to tell you that our forecasts say it is a growing segment. You know, exactly how big is it going to be, that's everybody's guess. Uh, but we do know that, you know, the traditional full-size truck buyer, you know, might start to look at some of these mid-sized vehicles and say, you know what, uh, mid-size gives me all the room that I need for my everyday, you know, driving and business needs. Uh, it's maybe a little easier on my pocketbook. It's easy. It parks in the garage. You know, I can shut the garage door. Uh, so it, it meets my needs. I perhaps don't need that traditionally sized pickup truck. So depending on how many people make that decision, uh, I think uh, it warrants a lot of people wanting to get into the segment. So, so how do you move people to think in terms of, of thinking in terms of Honda in a pickup truck? I mean, if you think about it, that when it comes to sedans, Accord, Civic, you know, people are very loyal to those, just as people are very loyal to Chevy and Ford when it comes to pickup trucks and Ram. Um, how, do you, how do you change their perceptions or move them in this direction? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, at Honda, we have been uh, refortifying our, our truck business for some period of time now. Uh, you know, the reality is we build a variety of trucks, not necessarily pickup trucks, but you stop to consider that we build the CRV, which is the number one uh, sport utility in its category and has been for about the last 11 years. You know, we built a pilot that is just, it's number one, uh, it will be, we believe, number one in its category in a few years once we get a little additional capacity. But we can't keep those on the shelves right now. They, they pop out as soon as they, they're offloaded from the, uh, the car hauler. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been building more trucks uh, year by year. Uh, our Odyssey minivan is the gold standard of, of minivans. So we think it's only natural that we continue to expand our truck series. And you know, being in the pickup uh, truck business is just a natural. Uh, so we think this, this truck will give us all plus business and it answers a need that our customers have. You know, roughly 20% of our customers have a pickup truck in their garage. We want it to be a Honda Ridgeline. <laughs> hey Jeff, with that we're going to have to wrap up this segment. We've got more people coming on to talk the specifics, more of the engineering specifics of the truck. But I want to thank you for taking your time to come on the show with Gary and I here. Okay, thank you very much. Real good. Hey, we're going to be back with more right after this. Let me show you some of the styling cues on the new Honda Ridgeline that really make it stand out from other trucks in its class. Of course, you've got a very Honda looking front end, big badge like all trucks do. Also on trucks these days, you see some sort of a C-clamp kind of look around the headlamps. Honda's got this the way that they've taken the running lights and put it around the headlamps. Something that you'll see on all the major big trucks these days too. Another little interesting bit is this quarter glass right inside the mirror. It actually does help in your visibility. The other thing is, look at this long crease line that runs from front to rear of the truck. It really helps make it look longer, but like BMW does, they don't take that crease line into the fender well. It makes it look like the fender well is even bigger than what it really is. This I find very interesting, the way they've scalloped out the steel for the door handles. It's kind of an oval, very soft look, almost feminine. Kind of surprised me to see this on a pickup truck. The other thing that you'll notice is this cladding on the lower end of the rocker is actually narrower at the front and wider at the rear. That gives the truck more of an angled look, a wedge look, and that helps define it looking as a truck. The other thing you'll notice is, unlike the old uh, Ridgeline that had that flying buttress look to it, Boom, the new one, they've cut it off. They really want this to look like a regular pickup, not something weird. They've also added this piece here for aerodynamics. It carries out beyond the cab just a little bit and it's, and it's cantilevered on the inside of it to keep the airflow going down. As you come to the rear of the truck, there's nothing too outstanding from a styling standpoint, but again, you see more arrow on the top of the tailgate here for aerodynamics, but something unique to Honda, it doubles. 
If you remember the old station wagons of back in the 60s and 70s that opened into a double way, Hondas put that on their truck. That to me, of all these things, is what makes the Ridgeline stand out from other pickups. Okay, we're back from that little styling walk around of the truck. And right now we've got yet another one of the people who helped make this truck become a reality. Kerry McClure, who's the large project leader, which essentially means chief engineer, right? That's correct. That's correct. The large project leader is one of the terms we use at Honda to confuse everybody else. So, so, so basically the truck is your baby. You could say that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Kerry, when you set out to redo the ridge line, uh, did you think, okay, we got to go clean sheet, we got to take lessons learned from the, the last one, we got to add things, you know, take us through the narrative a little bit of how you set about going to develop this truck. Sure. Um, you know, we always start by going back to the customer and, and trying to understand what the customers need, what the customers want. And in this case, we had uh, oh, almost 200,000 customers out there in the market that owned the previous generation Ridgeline. So we checked with them first to find out what they wanted or what they didn't get in their original Ridgeline. Um, we talked to our dealers, but then we also wanted to expand the, the product to more customers. So we had to talk to those that maybe didn't purchase the first one and figure out why. You know, what could we do to make them happy as well? And what they tell you, especially the ones who had not bought the truck in the first place? You know, the biggest, uh, the biggest issues with the original version, again, it, it had so much technology when it launched, so much innovation when it launched. It had great fuel economy. and. It drove great when it launched, but it aged over its life cycle. So what customers were telling us was that they wanted more fuel economy, they wanted more technology, and uh, the ones that didn't purchase it were a little bit concerned about the image, the styling of the, the styling, because, yeah, I, I would agree with that. The styling, of the it, to me, it was kind of clunky looking. The truck it drove was. brilliantly, but it was clunky so, looking. So, so this is 2006 when the first one came yes, out? Yes, that's correct. So, so obviously the technology had moved along in that period of time? Quite, I mean, for the entire industry, the technology changed remarkably from when it launched to, to where we're at today. So, And then the first one was an all-wheel drive only, and this is all-wheel and two-wheel? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, with the first generation, again, it, it met its needs at the time for the customers that purchased it, but the fact that it didn't look traditional left a little bit of a question mark in some people's minds as to if it doesn't look like a truck, can it really do what trucks are supposed to do? So we wanted to change the, the exterior image and make it more traditional in its shape. Um, but yet the Honda, the Honda twist on that was we still wanted it to be modern and fresh and still stand out as a unique truck in this segment. So, so basically for, for those who are not familiar with the first generation, you basically had what was almost like a sail panel for the C-pillar. The, the right. flying buttress. Fly, flying buttress coming down. And, and now you basically have a 90 degree angle cut. So much more traditional so shape. So box in cab shape sort That's of. Right. Sort of thing. Now, platform-wise, this is very similar to the Honda Pilot Acura MDX, is it not? That's correct. This platform actually was intended to be applied to a pickup truck first, but we ended up, uh, you know, re-prioritizing our vehicle, so it went into the MDX and the Pilot, and then now it's going into the Ridgeline. So powertrain, pretty similar. Right. Uh, the the suspension kind of similar too, although you've got this unique uh, independent rear suspension on, yeah, this, so on the Ridgeline. The suspension kinematics between the Pilot and the Ridgeline are very similar, but we did have to change uh, almost 50% of the components uh, to, to provide the strength and durability required for a truck. Obviously there's different loads, different payload requirements, different towing requirements for a truck versus an SUV, so we made all those required changes to make the, the parts stronger. And, and you have some, some real capability in this vehicle. Tell us some of the numbers in terms of payloads well, and towing capacity. Yeah, as Jeff said, you know, we, we always are fighting the perception that if it's not by down frame, it's not capable of something. And, you know, finally, that's, that's just a lack of education on what actually it takes to do those different things. So for us, we have a class leading payload. Um, it's 1,584 pounds. Um, we also have uh, our... Uh, uh, 5,000 pound towing, um, and we're very proud of that as well. Um, that's in all, all conditions, all vehicles, even our heaviest grade can still tow the 5,000 pounds. Um, and it comes standard with the trailer hitch, the seven pin connector, um, heavy duty cooling fans, and uh, ATF coolers. Um, so you, the customer only doesn't, you know, doesn't have to add any additional components to be able to tow. Mm -hmm. And you know, part of that uh, towing hitch you made standard just from a perception standpoint. So that, people would look at it and see there's a tow hitch on that it. That was a very interesting thing that we came across in some clinics where customers would look at um, even the attitude of the vehicle. And if the back of the car was up a little bit higher than the front, 
they would make some conclusion that therefore it must be able to haul payload. Same with the trailer hitch. If they saw the hitch, must be able to tow. And they just assumed these things. And it was, it was eye-opening to us that small details could cause such a perception shift in the customer. So absolutely, we wanted the trailer hitch to be standard on all the ridge lines. So, so one of the things that, that Honda does very well is manufacture motorcycles, and a lot of people transport their bikes in the beds of their trucks. Did you talk to the guys who were on the uh, motorcycle side of the business as you were developing we this? Actually, we actually do, and um, you know, we want to make sure that all of our products, there's a nice synergy between all of our products, whether it's power sports, um, power equipment, um, motorcycles, ATVs, side-by-sides, and, and, the, and the trucks. And we, we learned that our motorcycle products were getting larger over the years. Uh, so that led us to looking at making the bed larger so we can haul our own products, right? So um, that's that, one of the reasons we added the four inches to the, to the overall bed size was to be able to haul our own mm -hmm. stuff. And so the overall vehicle is bigger than the first generation, correct? It's three inches longer in the wheelbase. Um, the, we put most of that into the bed, so the bed's now four inches longer than the previous What's one. What's the total overall length of the bed? The overall length of the bed with the tailgate up is five foot four inches long. So if, if you're talking about the five foot class of vehicles, then we have the largest overall length of the bed. And okay, good. I can get my my cross country skis in the back. I can get my uh, mountain bike in the back and all that. But your mountain bike inside as well. Yeah. The cab. Oh, really? Yeah. Explain that. Well, you know, we have this really versatile rear seat where it folds up. It's split 60/40. It folds up out of the way. Um, and unlike the the traditional body on frame trucks, under the seat you don't have the obstructions due to the the construction of the car. So when you fold up our seat, you have this completely wide open storage space. Um, you can put many, many mountain bikes inside with the front or front tire on the car on the on the bike. You don't have to take it off. Um, you can also actually store items such as golf bags under that seat, uh, because again, we have this space that no other trucks have. You know, one of the things you know, we we drove the truck yesterday, and and the thing that really astonishes me about it is that it doesn't drive like a truck. And I think everybody knows what driving like a truck is, okay? Right. But this is more like driving a car. I mean, comfortable, easy to maneuver. How'd you guys do that? It, it goes back to the unibody construction and the independent suspension. Um, you know, the body is, is so much stiffer. It's 28% stiffer than the previous Ridgeline, which was already many times stiffer than any body on frame vehicle. Um, just due to the fact that the whole entire cab bed structure is all one unit. Um, so that stiffness combined with the suspension, the suspension tuning, um, it just lends itself to a much more comfortable ride without all the compromises. Um, it doesn't beat you to death, literally, right. like some of the other some of the other vehicles can, um, and, and it makes just for a more enjoyable, uh, enjoyable, fun drive. It's hard to hard to not like how it feels. Mm -hmm. Well, good. We're going to have to wrap up this segment. We still have more to talk about on the Ridge Line, uh, but Carrie, want to thank you for coming on Auto Line After Hours with thank Gary you. and myself here. Thanks for having me. Real good, and we're going to be back with more just right after this. Okay, we're inside the new Honda Ridgeline, and I think what's interesting is that for the past decade or so, all truck manufacturers have been working very, very hard at having interiors of their vehicles be more car-like, offer more comfort, offer more amenities and accessories and so on. And they've all been doing a pretty good job, and I think that the place where the Ridgeline really excels is that the interior of this vehicle feels more like a car than any truck I have had the opportunity to be in. And I mean, that, that starts from the steering wheel all the way through the gauges, the HVAC system, um, the materials that they're using on the instrument panel, nice soft touch material here, harder material down here because after all, this is a truck. Um, there's nice stitching on the seats, and I, I think that without trying to over-luxury the interior of the vehicle, what they've done is they have just simply said, okay, let's take the best that we know from our sedans and, and bring it to this without sacrificing any of the utility. And then they really did go big on utility. I mean, for example, we have this very large bin here that you can put... Uh, uh, pads and so on. There are a couple of uh, outlets on the inside there. Um, another thing that they did, and they, they made a point, because let's face it, this is, this is basically a unibody vehicle, and they were able to take advantage of space behind the rear, below the rear seats. And if we can see back here that there's actually enough room that you could put 
a uh, set of golf clubs back there and they're saying you know this is something that is uh, distinctive to what the ridgeline can do because of the way that it has been engineered um, you know you're also finding that you know that they have uh, top-notch audio in this vehicle they have comfortable seating in the front they're seating for people in the back obviously two with comfort one who sort of has it uh, modified but you know, overall, I think that when you get in this, this vehicle, you have a, a really solid sense that you're in something different. It almost strikes me that, that um, just as SUVs have morphed into crossover vehicles, while there are still SUVs that exist, this becomes almost the crossover of pickup trucks. And I think that Honda may have actually um, gotten the DNA for something that, that hasn't really existed before. And the interior, I think, uh, really says that in a big way. Okay, we're back from having taken a look at the interior of the vehicle, sitting around the round table, and joining us right now is Jim Loftus. The, let's see if I got this right. The performance lead engineer That's on right. the Ridgeline. You're a chief engineer, but I'm, you you had to develop how this thing rides and drives. Exactly. My, my responsibility were exactly that. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a chief engineer responsible for the overall performance of the vehicle. So we were talking a little bit uh, earlier about the difference between a unit body truck versus mm -hmm. a body on frame and sort of the way I describe it Jim is that on a, a body on frame truck you get I, I call it jiggling I, I know that's not the right technical term but I explain why you get that on a body on frame and how you've avoided that with uh, this unit body approach that, that that jiggle is what we like to call aftershake uh, the aftershake feeling that uh, you get with now that. some truckers love that in What's fact that? that's what helps define what a truck is for them you know, I've heard that, and I'm, I, that, that's it was a probably in 1968. <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> I think it was with the technology, and, and people have come to accustom that. That's what they expect out of a truck. They expect that jiggle. They expect that shake. Obviously, what you're feeling um, on the body on frame is just the isolation. Of course, um, the the body on frame, you know, dates way back to the horse and buggy, and finally, you you know, you have a frame, and then you have a body that is mounted right on top of that overall frame structure so and then of course there's some isolation between the two so that's a lot of times what you feel in that vehicle is you're feeling uh, as i mentioned that aftershake where in the unibody construction you don't you just don't have that because you have the complete construction all tied in in one mm -hmm. so it seems to me that when you drive a traditional pickup truck without something in the bed that you get more of that i mean is is the vehicle those vehicles tuned to take loads and you basically have just created a structure that can deal with loads or lack thereof? Exactly. Actually, when we talk or when we look for years, for years, if you want to talk about the body on frame, uh, the things the things you looked at were, of course, the leaf springs. So pickup trucks, body on frame trucks for years have had leaf springs. And of course, you'd look at different different load ratings where you're talking half ton, three quarter ton. And of course, what did you do? You put a different leaf, you know, you put an additional leaf in the spring. And of course, that would change the what we like to call the attitude of the actual vehicle. And that I.e., was, the rear end would sit up even higher. Exactly, which basically um, would allow you to put more payload in it. The penalty for that was, of course, when you didn't have any weight in it, it was it was so stiff that you would get beat up, mm -hmm. so, to, so to say, when you were driving that vehicle on a on a daily basis when you when you didn't have actually have it loaded. Right. So we would see even some with some of those customers, and you see some of those customers today, they'll they'll physically load it because they're driving it every day, which of course adds weight to the vehicle, affects fuel economy, affects even the overall steering and handling of the, of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. In the unibody construction, you don't have that. I've, obviously, we can we can design we can design the strength, the stiff uh, the stiffness of the vehicle, the subframes. We set up the suspension specifically, you know, specifically for those needs. So you you really get the the what we like to call the goodness of of the unibody construction uh, when you drive the vehicle, whether it's loaded or unloaded. Okay, if anyone listening is wondering what the jet noise is, I think we must be next door to. Uh, an Air National Guard base, because I'm looking at what seems to be F-16s flying overhead. So that's the background noise. But speaking of noise, you guys have done something really cool in the bed of this truck. Mm -hmm. You don't have speakers in the bed. You have what you call exciters. So tell us what that all means. So um, a lot of people, and, and I remember the first time I actually saw it, I had the same question, or the first question that came out of my mouth is, where's the speaker? 
And of course, we were working with our audio, audio engineers back in Ohio, and what the first answer out of their mouth is, well, it's the entire bed. The entire bed's the speaker. And it's like, what do you mean? What, what does that mean? Well, on the, every one of the panels, the side panels, um, there's what we call the exciter. The exciter is what would, what would be similar on a normal, traditional speaker would be the magnet. But the actual uh, poly, uh, polypropylene glass reinforced panel itself would be the cone. So what you actually have is we have two exciters on the back of each one of those panels, those being you know, what would be traditionally a magnet, and then once again that panel, the cone. So the entire panel itself is generating... So you know, the bed generating. of the truck is essentially a speaker. The entire bed is, is a speaker. So you can turn it up to 11 more. What's that? 11. <laughs> And of course, one of the really actually. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by using these exciters instead of having actual speakers, they're they're impervious to the weather. And they were designed specifically for that. You, they're they're weatherproof. They're waterproof. You can use them while you're washing your car, when you're doing your landscaping. We've even filled the bed full of mulch and had the speakers running. I assure you that it does actually work. Kind of muffled, but uh, uh, well, of course, you know you have that ins or you have a lot of insulation right, in that right, mulch, right. but uh, absolutely, it still works. And the other thing, as far as impact strength and everything, we've protected for all that. Of course, you're in a pickup truck, right? So people are going to be loading things in and out of that bed. And of course, as Honda engineers, we've we've considered all of that. You know, talking of the bed, one thing we haven't spoken of is is the fact that you guys have that trunk below the bed. That's right. The Which the original trunk. one had, the, but, but you've made some modifications to it. We made some modifications and, and actually uh, by pushing uh, the silencer in the pre-chamber forward in the vehicle, uh, the previous generation had a step in it. By put, like I said, by pushing that forward, we've been able to open that up for the bigger modules. Uh, we did have feedback of people saying, oh, my golf bag won't fit, those types of things. We took those right to heart and made sure that um, the next generation could fit all those key modules, those big coolers, your golf bags, all the, all the things you want to take with you wherever you go. So it's like an 82 quart cooler or oh, something we can like get that? An 82 I mean, quart cooler. And if you need bigger, the great thing about it is it's got the drain in the bottom. Just fill the whole thing with ice and, and use beer. the whole thing as a cooler. <laughs> exactly. Talk about the spare too, because on other trucks, the spare is mounted bo bo underneath, underneath the bed, the and you got to sort of winch it down and drag it out. And you guys used your trunk to package the exactly. spare. Exactly. So as you open the trunk, there's two there's there's two nuts that you remove, and the the it's on a, a slider panel, like you, a tray, like a tray. You, and actually, there's molded in handles in that tray, and you just slide it back. And there's two uh, areas that you just set it in the ledge. Therefore especially with the dual action tailgate. You swing the tailgate out of the way, it's right there. You pick up the tire, you know, you change it. Okay, now the viewers are saying, what do you mean dual action tailgate? Dual action tailgate, of course. Uh, the signature dual action tailgate allows the tailgate to not only fold down like a traditional pickup truck, but it allows it to completely rotate out of the out of the way, so you have opens much like a door. Access. Exactly, you know, it swings like a door. You can walk to back to the truck. You can get deeper into the bed, and of course, you can get into the Honda in bed trunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's go back to getting this thing driving the way that you want it. Uh, we, we talked all about the unibody construction. We talked about independent suspension, but nonetheless you've got this thing really dialed in well from a steering, handling, or yeah, handling, uh, acceleration, braking. Uh, go through what some of the parameters were that you really set out to, to make this a benchmark in the way it drives. Every, um, from a performance standpoint, every, um, we had talked about uh, a little bit the, the grand concept of the vehicle, the, the idea of life's adventure guide, wherever you're gonna go. The performance dynamics were critical in that and, and what we looked at was just this idea of personal, prepared and capable. So those steer, the, the steering, the handling, the payload were critical in all of that. So the balance, uh, I think what you're getting to John is maybe the balance. How do you balance the, the braking, the steering, the handling? We considered it very deeply but the, the, the whole idea of the truck, once again, is when you, were, when you get in it, whether you're towing, whether you're hauling that payload, whether you're just driving back and forth to, um, to work, the idea was it was effortless. It was easy to drive in every one of those conditions. 
uh, especially towing. We talked about that in towing. We talked about 5,000 pounds, uh, you know, maintaining 5,000 pounds as standard on the, on the vehicle. We really set out to make sure that f towing 5,000 pounds was not exciting. I mean, there's nothing worse than getting out, towing, a tra towing your boat trailer, towing um, a camper or something like that, and it, it gets squirrely on you. That, that's exactly where you don't want to be. So there was so much time spent uh, balancing all those things, the, the brakes, the acceleration, uh, the towing, all of those things to really make it easy for the customer and make it comfortable for the customer also, you know, which, which really makes it confident. You know, it, it, keep, it makes you very confident. It's confidence inspiring. It'll make you do those things that maybe you wouldn't do. And you, and you can drive this in the dirt. I'm, I'm, I'm getting this sense that we're talking about towing and driving on the highway, but you guys have set this up so people can go somewhat off-road with this absolutely and that is the that uh, that is where the honda really shines and and p the expectation from people of of course you know it's going to drive good on road it's unibody uh, we get that oh it's a honda but the what people don't know is exactly that how great this vehicle is to drive off-road and our and our true advantage with the honda ridgeline uh, especially with our all-wheel all drive system is torque vectoring when you get out on those uh, on those different courses in the off-road course, it's amazing how easy the vehicle is to drive uh, drive through these courses. Of course, you don't you don't push you don't you really don't have the the understeer that you would normally feel in a in a traditional four-wheel drive system. So you can even uh, there's a, a couple different situations where you put it in. It, it's it's hard not to drive it fast. You naturally want to get in it and drive it as fast as you can, and almost try and put it off the road. So, um, th and that that goes back to the old Ridgeline. It was such a pleasure and such a fun to dr drive vehicle. Whether you were in the snow, the sand, it was really what made the Ridgeline what it is today. Mm -hmm. You know, even though we've been talking with three different Honda executives about this truck. We've barely scratched the surface. There's a lot of neat features in that I encourage our viewers to go out and find more about because it, it is a cool truck and there's a lot to it. But we're gonna have to wrap up this segment anyway, Jim, and really wanna thank you for uh, having taken the time to come talk with us here today. Um, it was a pleasure to be here with you. Real good. Hey, we're gonna take uh, a quick break right now, com commercial break. We're gonna be coming back to talk about some of the news of what's been going on. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back talking all about Ridgeline, other things going on in the industry. Joining us right now, Joe Philippi. Joe, great having you here. Thank you, John. Good so, to be here. Just so the, the, the viewers know, I, you've been on the show in the past, but to bring them up to speed, you, you spent a lot of time as an analyst on Wall Street, right? 35 years. 35 years. And now you're what, sort of like a consultant? Independent and, consultant to yeah. investors and companies. So you used well. to be a very tall man, and then you spent 35 years. And... <laughs> I got pounded down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, so you're a numbers guy. So it's time for Dr. Data. Okay, we got some data. So okay, we're in Texas, right? And and everybody deep knows in the heart of. deep <laughs> everything's bigger in Texas. And and so naturally everybody says this is truck country. It is. Right? Right. So so I was I was uh -oh, looking I think he's gonna prove us wrong. Well, okay, so I was looking <laughs> at the numbers and this is from the uh, Texas DMV. The latest numbers I could get were for twenty thirteen. Number of passenger vehicles. Okay, so mm -hmm. we're talking passenger cars, cars sold. and SUVs sold. registered. Registered. Okay, in the state of Texas, for 2013 is 12.8 million. 12.8 million passenger, passenger vehicles. vehicles. Okay, now the pickup truck category, which can be light duty, heavy duty, pickup trucks, 5.8 million. Wow. But. That doesn't count the ones up on blocks in the front yard. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you got it. Uh, not registered, yeah. but used so, on the it, farm. It, it did say, it, but it, I mean, it seemed rather astonishing to me. I mean, that there was that 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 big of a difference. So anyway. But this is the biggest pickup state, right? Without I mean, doubt. More more pickups sold in Texas yeah, than anywhere else. One. Right. Which is saying something because California has, I I want to say, something like 10 million more people in the population than does Texas. Yet Texas buys more pickups than California. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, but they're all urbanites and suburbanites and, you know, other than the uh, sort of suburban cowboys. Yeah. You know, it's all farms. In, yeah. So, so Joe, John and I have been talking to the Honda people about the Ridge Line. Um, you've driven the Ridge Line. Um, what are your takeaways from this car? It's incredibly quiet. Um, it's, I use the term well screwed together. Um, everything feels solid. The interior materials, even on the base truck, for example, the IP, you know, excluding whether you get the bigger screen for nav or whatever, all of the surface materials are the same and it's all high quality mm -hmm. material. And it's amazingly quiet no matter which version you get. Um, it's bigger than the com most of the competitors, I think, than all the competitors. It, even in terms it doesn't of cabin, look bigger. Cabin width yeah, yeah, inside. Yeah. But it doesn't look bigger than the yeah. others. No, it doesn't. But the cabin width inside, you get a lot of elbow room in there. And, and it's comfortable in the back seat. All right, so, so Colorado is, is doing really well. Um, Tacoma continues to lead the segment. Um, the Frontier is old, but it's still selling. Because um, the whole segment stopped. Right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, do you see from a financial perspective, from the analyst perspective, that this is going to make some inroads in, into that uh, segment? Is it going to make it larger? Is it going to take away from someone? What do you think? I think it might keep some competitors out. They may start rethinking their strategy, and we know. There's, well, uh, there's only two left, right? Ford well, and Ram. And, well, then you, you count Volkswagen, maybe. You know, oh, They talk oh, about the possibility yeah. of bring in the, I think it's the Amarok from South America, which is a pretty capable looking truck. But, you know, again, there's only so much room. You've got 250,000 or so Ridgeline sold, about 175,000 are still with their original owners. So you, you, there's a great loyal owner base out there. And if you look at this new truck versus the other truck, all the improvements, all the features, the safety, asked, safety features, if you will, and um, and all the other uh, fun things, in terms of uh, of accessories, et cetera, um, I think he could get a lot of folks stepping up and turning it over. You know, is it going to have a big impact on the market? You know, at at maybe twenty thousand a year, that's not going to move the needle very much. Mm -hmm. But the the key for Honda, from a financial standpoint, is selling out their targeted volume, right? So, you know, sell another two hundred and fifty thousand over the next six or probably five to six years mm -hmm. of, of a cycle. Mm -hmm. Now this truck is very late. This was supposed to have been a 12, right? It was introduced in five, 2005, 2006, and it was supposed to be replaced in 2012, but a little thing called the crash of 2008 yeah. and nine <laughs> got in the way and everything got deferred. Right. So is it a good time for it? I think it is. I think it is. I mean, uh, you, got, you got lots of advertising out there by, by GM and, uh, you know, Chevy and GMC. Um, lots of talk about the possibility of, well, and a new Tacoma, again, pitching, you know, the, the mid-sized truck, if you will. Um, it's probably a good time to be in the marketplace. Plus the fact that, you know, the economy is not growing as fast as we'd like, but the economy is healthy. Right. And, you know, tradesmen need pickup trucks. They may not need a half full full-size half ton, true half ton, if you will, to three-quarter ton, but this will fill, you know, a lot of application, duty applications. So, so all of us, we, we, we've driven the new Tacoma, and we've driven the new Colorado and, and, and Canyon. Um, so what do you think, John, in terms of, will somebody who is a, a Tacoma intender say, you know what, I think I'll go look at that Ridgeline? I think unlikely. You know, the Tacoma is a really hardcore truck. If, if you want to do serious off-roading, it, it's got all the capability of doing, and it's got that macho image. This Ridgeline is not macho at all. In fact, some of the, the styling characteristics, as I pointed out, are almost delicate, mm -hmm. you know, almost feminine. I think that this Ridgeline is going to appeal to people who otherwise would not buy a pickup. You've, you've got the loyal owners that bought the new one, they'll come back for, or bought the old one, they'll come back for the new one. I think this is going to appeal to people who said, you know, those trucks, even though they're called midsize, they're still too damn big. They are hard to step up into, even though it's not as bad as a full-size pickup. They, they ride with the jiggly ride that I was describing earlier. This one does not. I, I think this is going to open up the market to people who otherwise would say, you know, I'm going to go with an SUV, but now yeah. I'm going to go with this, this Ridgeline because it meets my needs, and it's got a bed in the back. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's the thing that intrigues me because the the old ridge line never really I, I've yet to see one to be honest with you with a cap on it. They tell me there are caps I've never seen for one. the old ridge line, right? Incredibly difficult to put a cap with that slanted bed top and then the the buttress in the back, right? Really difficult. The new one was basically designed to put a conventional cap on and they've got I think a three section hard tonneau that flips back that makes it a lot more practical. Now, if you're an SUV owner, you you do a lot of outdoors things, fishing, whatever, um, and you got a lot of dirty stuff, you know, duck decoys, God knows what, um, you generally don't want to throw it in the back of your SUV, right? I have a Grand Cherokee. And Joe, by the way, is a hunter, and he has, <laughs> he has all that stuff. <laughs> and, and then some. But, you know, very often I'm, you know, I'm going to get bags of mulch and two by fours or whatever, I can't just throw it in the back of my Grand Cherokee because the cabin space is limited, even with the the second row seat down. In this case, I can do all that, and I've got a bed that tailgate flops down. I can put sheets of plywood in easily. Um, all of a sudden, I got a fairly practical vehicle right. that is really nicely appointed. You know, and it's interesting you mentioned the Grand Cherokee and um, unibody, you know, unibody, and, right. and and so we were talking about this and. And, but you remember that Jeep calls it uniframe. They don't uh -huh. call it unibody. Right. <laughs> and, and it's almost as though, I mean, so I, I think a lot of people might perceive, you know, the whole unibody thing as being, nah, that, that can't be capable. And you a, know, you've, got yeah. a, you've got a Grand Cherokee. Yeah, it's it's like duty like a car. No, the, but, I mean, the Grand do... Cherokee is, you can take it on a Rubicon Trail, right. just put on rock rails and bigger mm -hmm. tires and sure. you're ready to go. Right. Yeah, it's, that's one tough truck. Mm -hmm. Hey, Joe, I'm interested in you saying you think they're only going to sell 20,000 of these reg lines? I, I, I may be wrong. I got, I'd have to check my numbers, but yeah. I think they're going to do really well Cause I want to say with the, uh, vehicle. the with the original Ridge Line, I want to say the first year they did like fifty thousand. The first year, I don't know if they've got the manufacturing capacity to do that, but uh, man, at twenty thousand or that that doesn't move my needle a whole lot. No, I, I, I think I'm, I'm probably wrong on that. I'd have right. to go okay. back and check my numbers. Okay, but uh, but uh, you know they had the first mover advantage with the first Ridge Line. You know now they've now they've got I think a really great advantage with a dramatically upgraded vehicle in terms of, you know, cabin space. It's bigger, even though it's the same overall exterior envelope. So you got more cabin space. You got the entire suite of, of safety features. Okay, you're an analyst. You look at all the numbers. What do you think is going to happen to the profitability of this segment? You know, Chevy, GMC have jumped in. You know, Honda is now jumping in. There might be others coming into it, too. Uh, sounds to me like they're going to have to slice the profits more thinly. One more entrant, and that's the break point on profitability, because then everybody's got to fill their targeted vo sales volume. And what happens? We start discounting. We start, you know, doing aggressive leasing deals, et cetera. And that's what I worry about when I, when I read headlines that, that, you know, Ford's thinking about the Ranger, Sergio is thinking about the, uh, you know, what do we do with the, a Dakota-sized vehicle or bringing something even smaller from South America. And that, there goes profitability. Is there you know? any possibility that this will eat into full size? I mean, it hasn't happened yet, but do you think uh, people will become more intrigued with these? Only on the margin. Only on the margin. There's so many more things you can do with a full-size pickup in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, capat hauling stuff. <laughs> right. That that I think it's only going to be on the margin. Mm -hmm. Okay, we we've talked now, from bridge line. Well, one point though, if gasoline prices start going up again, you know, dramatically, then I think full-size pickups, as they inevitably have in the past, then I think you got a situation where you might see, you know, a, a, some erosion. Of, of share of the full size. What's dramatic? A five percent would be dramatic. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, in terms of gasoline price hike. Oh well, right now well, I guess we're on two bucks. I'm going to say because that's what I see at right. home in New Jersey. You know, I say if we get back up to three bucks, that's got a. That's it's the rate of increase really that causes and uh, the market. It suddenly starts again. happening a lot. You know, right. if you boil the frog slowly, no problems. But if you see spike hikes, you well, know. Uh, three months ago at the local. BP, I was paying a dollar forty-eight a gallon. Now it's one ninety-eight a gallon. Mm -hmm. You know, plus or minus a penny. Yeah, or but that's still so cheap. Nobody cares that it went up that fast. Well, and, but but at the same time, the fuel economy of my vehicle has improved dramatically. Of the Grand Cherokee. Of all of them. Of all. You yeah. know, yeah. Okay, what else is going on? We've talked enough Ridgeline now. All right, so um, we had sales 
come in for for April, and um, it, it it looks pretty robust. Yep. Um, yep. Bounce back from from March. Mm -hmm. Strong SAR, yeah. 17.5, 17, 17.4, 17, 17.5, but right. but some weaknesses at the edges too. Yeah. Um, you know, Wrangler is just a one percent increase. Speaking of Jeep that we were we were talking about earlier, Cherokee down seven percent for the for yeah. April. Um, Renegade up 131 percent. So this leads me to wonder, Joe, is it people actually going for smaller vehicles and foregoing these slightly larger vehicles? I mean, well, there, there's three almost totally different segments, if you will, within mm -hmm. within a Jeep brand. I mean, uh, Cherokee is a great little, a great vehicle, um, but I think. Well, it's hard to tell. I mean, Chrysler has had such aggressive incentive money on virtually everything. But, you know, in the case of the Wrangler, summer's coming, right? So yeah. people start thinking about outdoors and, you know, you, there are a lot of ways to pitch a Wrangler. Right. To, to but post. the Renegade, I mean, it's on fire. Um, it's the hottest segment in the business right now. Yeah, you know, I mean, compact we, SUV. yeah, we look at the Chevy Trax, you look at Buick Encore, you look at a little vehicle like the Renegade and, and others. And... Um, you know, it, it's it's probably a great second car, third car in a family for a youngster. Uh, you got all-wheel drive capability. You got a complete suite of safety systems. Not surprising mm -hmm. to some extent. And you know, the other thing too is, uh, if you go back a year ago, Renegade was still in a ramp up, so the percentage increase right now right, is going to look realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you look at Wrangler, I, I dare say they're capacity constrained. I don't. I think you're right. I don't think they can I don't squeeze think another can. handful no. of units it, out. Look, this is why Chrysler or FCA wants to rejigger its whole manufacturing footprint. They need more Rams. They need more Cherokees. You know, this is why they're getting rid of the 200 and the Dart and I, I guess the the Patriot and uh, what Compass. and the Compass are going to get broomed out. You know, again to make more room for Cherokees. Yeah, and then they'll have the uh, I guess a something akin to a, a, da a seven eight scale Grand Cherokee is in the pipeline that's going to be built in uh, mm -hmm. South America, in Brazil, in Brazil, Pernambuco. All right, one, one, of, the, one of the pairs that I, I enjoy looking at is, is Cadillac and Lincoln. And, and I thought in terms of sales, um, you know, Cadillac is continuing to just, just decline and decline and decline. So for April, its sales were down by uh, nearly 29%. That's a big drop. And Lincoln sales were up by 20%. Now, the thing that I thought was most telling is the fact that you know, Cadillac strength has been the light truck in terms of SRX, Escalade, and so on, right? And um, so for, for the month of April, its light truck sales were down 39, 35%. Meanwhile, over at Lincoln, they were up 53%. And when you look at the actual number of vehicles, Lincoln light truck outsold Cadillac light truck. See, that blows my mind. That, that's that's I would not have expected. Well, to a great extent, Cadillac is out of capacity on Escalades. To, to kind of so stretch that, so that to explains the limit. why the number of well, Escalades is down. But at the same time, SRX is going through its run out as you finally start ramping up uh, production XT5. of, the, of mm -hmm. the XT5, which you know, and SRX was their volume leader at Cadillac. Uh, most people wouldn't normally think about that because you know they didn't it's not a striking vehicle to a, a lot of folks or is it when you think cadillac you think escalate, escalate the, that's the first thing that comes to mind mm -hmm. and i know there's a big fight within cadillac over allocation u.s market versus rest of world and i know that johan de Nyssen, who runs cadillac has said that it's a constant battle and when he allocates more product to say like the middle east or something where those escalades are red hot he gets a massive amount of complaints from his U.S. dealers. So part of it may be that Cadillac's U.S. Escalade sales are a little soft right now, but globally they're just going gangbusters. Well, you know, Escalades do really well in the fleet market, you know, the, uh, the livery car market, uh, both the long wheelbase as well as the short wheelbase. And they've been backing off a little bit on their, on their fleet General sales. General Motors has. Yeah, just, I mean, uh, they still Cadillac. make very good money, even though, you know, there's a, there's a fleet price. But once you start trying to allocate things, to, you know, does that side suffer versus shipping vehicles to Middle East or China or wherever? Mm -hmm. so, so speaking of luxury vehicles, I was surprised to see that BMW sales were down in April by 7.5% uh, yeah. for April and a 9.5% year over year. Um, 
then this week uh, or a couple of weeks ago that um, they came out with the extended range for the i3, their electric vehicle, bringing it up to about 114 mile range. From what, about 80? Um, 80. 80. Like yeah, that. it was 80 miles before. Yeah. Um, but then it came out that the head of i8, the manager of i powertrain, and the head of i product management all defected and went to a Chinese startup mobility company which is based by some some ten cent holding now John you were just in China recently we were we were in uh, Beijing and uh, for the Beijing Auto Show and it, yeah it's, it, it's kind of interesting we're just as in the US we see tech companies getting all into the automotive industry led by Google and Apple no we're seeing the same thing happening in China as well tech companies jumping into the automotive market so the fact that they poached three of the top guys, technical guys especially, away from the i brand tells me two things. Number one, they laid down a lot of money to get those guys to peel them away from BMW. And this is going to hurt BMW too, by the way, I got to believe. And the other thing, you know, it shows how much interest there is in China of getting into what they call new energy vehicles. So, so these would be electric cars, hydrogen cars, both? Um... Yeah, no, look, China has uh, put all its bets on battery electric, and there's a massive, massive amount of incentives. So I, I, I was in Beijing. One of the ways that the government there is trying to reduce car sales, because the traffic congestion is the absolute worst I've seen anywhere in the world, they've uh, limited how you can get a license plate. You have to enter a lottery. Right. And it's expensive. In, in Beijing, to get just a license plate is $13,500. But if you get an electric car, boom, boom, you don't have to get in the lottery. You don't have to pay a penny for your license plate. This, this is one of the ways that they're really pushing the industry into electrics. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they talk about, oh, we have to make the skies clean again. And it, believe me, the, the, the pollution in Beijing is horrific. It's a, absolutely as bad as you've ever heard. And... Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to me that uh, the Chinese have said battery is going to be it. They're not going with hydrogen fuel cells, whereas Japan and Germany are really starting to push hydrogen fuel cells. And we might have a, a big battle there mm -hmm. between which technology is going to, to come out on top. And we got to tell everybody, we're joined by another one of our colleagues right now, Ken Gross. Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. So, we, yeah, we were just talking about... Uh, uh, electric vehicles. Gary mentioned that uh, three of the top guys from the, the BMW i brand have been peeled away from BMW and joined a, a Chinese uh, IT company, tech company called Tencent. So, so you're you're highly familiar with BMW, Ken. Um, what do you see going on there? I mean, their sales in the U.S. are going down. Um, you know, every, everybody's paying attention to what's going on with Volkswagen, but, you know, here's, here's, you know, Daimler's going up, these guys are going down. What's happening, do you I think? don't know if I can explain it. I mean, uh, they make a great line of cars. They, uh, they've expanded exponentially over the last few years. Uh, so I, I, I really don't know. I mean, you might look at Mercedes-Benz and say they have a... Uh, a car in every single niche and BMW doesn't so for mm -hmm. some people uh, compare comparing that way but it's a mystery honestly mm -hmm. yeah in fact uh, BMW earnings were down for the first time in quite a while and their excuse is they're investing more heavily in, in technology, in technology yeah. like not just electric vehicles but uh, autonomous and connected and all that other sort of stuff too but isn't everybody else doing the same thing? I don't think that argument washes necessarily. No, you know, the, this whole thing with the defection of the three guys from the I group, the I3 has really been somewhat of a disappointment. You know, it's uh, it's very funky. The range was 80 miles. Now it's up 20 odd, 25 percent or so to 100, 110. Um, but it's still not, you know, a very practical everyday kind of vehicle. You know, it's not like a potential Model 3 or a Chevy Bolt. Yeah, what happens when the Bolt comes out? 200 mile range, and here's here's BMW saying, oh, we have these new batteries, and, and they're more highly efficient. Yeah, but at least the car costs more. <laughs> <You> know, <I> mean, <laughs> ironically, this is their 100th anniversary this year. So <clears throat> can they make it through the next century? I'm sure they will, but it's tough for them right now. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, do you think, you know, you were saying that, that they make great cars, and, and um, 
handle well and drive well. I mean, is, is sort of the bloom off the rose, not the yellow rose of Texas, um, uh, for, for BMW in terms of being a real aspirational vehicle as, as it has been for many, many years? I, I think there's definitely something to that. There are so many great cars to buy today. Uh, there's no longer the, uh, the kind of yuppie, BM, typical BMW driver who's flashing his headlights to pass you and so forth. So uh, this could be a real time of introspection for them. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they've they've proliferated so many models and so many variants off the off the same platform that they confuse customers in some respect. But, but yeah, you've got Mercedes your loyalists. Do the same thing. Mercedes has equally as many permutations of models. Well, they're chasing each other, right? With the with the the coupes. But Mercedes um, smells blood. They're they're saying that they could surpass uh, BMW this year. Yeah, I wouldn't. You know. Uh, the, the, the term smelling blood in the water is probably a good... Yeah. <laughs> well, and Lexus good. has come back, and I mean, right. they're, they're uh, mm -hmm. gaining, gaining the share that uh, they lost. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking globally, too, you know, and, yeah. and Lexus, even though it aspires to be a global brand, it's still not quite there yet. So, you know, you're mentioning the, um, the whole uh, BMW um, investing in, in autonomy and, and car sharing and so on and so forth. Um, so what do you guys make of the deal, as it were, between FCA and Google for FCA providing Google with 100 hybrid Pacificas that will be built specifically for autonomous car testing. I, I, I got to jump in on this. I don't see what the big hype, I do understand what the big hype is, but to me this is no different than FCA saying, hey, we just did a deal with Bosch to develop autonomous cars, or with Continental, or with Delphi. The fact that it's Google and FCA is what's gotten headlines all over. This is no different than an automaker ever, today or in the past, saying, hey, let's work with a supplier to develop a new technology. And we don't know everything about what they're developing together. Right, because they're they're talking to Delphi, they're talking to Continental, they're talking to Bosch and 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 others that we this probably is not don't an necessarily exclusive know. Agreement. The agreement right. says Google Google can work with any other car company it wants. Right. Chrysler, FCA can work with whatever other supplier it wants. I don't see that but, this is as big a deal as the headline. I mean, but what's, what's what's sort of interesting is is that right now Google has 24, 25 Lexus RX 450 H's running around autonomously, okay? And those cars apparently were purchased by Google, that they basically went to car dealers and Cupertino. Bought them and, and ripped them and, apart. And bought them yeah. and, and, and with this. So, and Toyota had nothing to do with the deal. Right, and so so here we have a case where basically, you know, the, the announcement from Sergio comes out and says, you know, we've got this this relationship and uh, we're gonna we're gonna be working with them now. One of the things that occurred to me is that you know we've all been in cars that were still being engineered, and especially cars that were being engineered with you know high technology braking systems, emergency braking, so on and so forth, where there's always this enormous amount of electronic gear in you know below the instrument panel and ton of it in the trunk. In the trunk, right? You know, you got a hybrid or a, a minivan, you suddenly have the architecture where you can readily deal with all that stuff. That, that's what that stolen go hole there, is there for. There you go. Right. Throw all the electronics in that. Well, I mean, sure. maybe you're developing, you, you're going to use hybrid minivans, right? PHEV right. minivans combined with the Google technology suite, if you will, and, and you know, go from there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, To me, that's just more PR spin. You know, they're hybrids. Okay, whoopee-doo. I don't see how that affects it being an autonomous vehicle at all. Oh no, not at all. I mean, it's. I mean, we know it's coming, so you know, the, the hybrid vehicles will be obviously adopting you know all the autonomous features that are available to be to be integrated into any vehicle. You were going to say, Ken? I, I think it shortcuts the process for uh, for Google in a, in a good way. I mean, and the funny little cars that they were testing, uh, I'm not sure that that's a serious proposition for most people. And it also sends a message that says, when we get this technology, as we're developing it, it can go anywhere. So you can still drive, perhaps, the car you like, uh, but we'll take care of it being autonomous. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the idea is, that this is a well-used term, plug and play, right, you, where you get vehicles that are literally equipped to be able to plug in autonomy in a box, the type of thing that Delphi has been developing, Look, for example. Here's the advantage for Google in this deal, is Chrysler's got approving grounds. They know how to put vehicles through a duty cycle. 
They've got all the test equipment. They've got all the people that know how to do that. Google does not. And so why create its own proving ground? Right now, the, all their testing has been done out on the open road or in computer simulation. This gives them the opportunity to work with an OEM and put it through its entire duty cycle and see how it works. Well, ju just think about what the, the announcement from Ford about three months ago that they finally have a system, I guess it's LiDAR based if I remember right, mm -hmm. that can see through the snow, right? Because, you know, all these Google cars are running around in sunny in, California, in, sunny California <laughs> in beautiful weather all the time, and people say, well, wait a minute, it rains. Well, they, they, they got them in Kirkland, Washington, and it rains up there a lot. But it snows in Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to me that 60 years ago, almost to the, to the year, General Motors had its Firebird 2 at the Motoramas, a four-passenger car that was designed turbine-powered to run on a guided highway. They didn't have the technology. They anticipated that someday this could happen. It was only 60 years ago. So how did how did they guide it? They didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just like the uh, those nose cones on the um, uh, Cadillac Cyclone, those Dagmar-esque nose tones, they uh, they knew they wanted some type of a sensor. They didn't have the technology. They figured it would they fit in these. And in the meantime, they looked like a Hollywood starlet. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't too many years ago that there was an experiment, I think in California somewhere, Southern California, where they, they were running some Buicks on a dedicated highway? Yeah, down in San Diego. Well, it was dedicated in the sense that they had to go in and bed the magnets. Mags, right. Yes. It, it, mags, yeah. It, magnets like a, right. every couple of feet. And they, there's a famous picture of a line of Buicks driving nose to tail with the drivers with their hands out the window to show that they weren't doing it. Right. And that's been the big change that's happened since DARPA initiated the DARPA challenge is that Wi-Fi and GPS has obviated the need for that kind of infrastructure. You no longer need sensors embedded in the pavement. You no longer need transponders at every intersection. Right. And that's why we're seeing this race forward so quickly right now in autonomy. But to that point, uh, they're now talking about a line of trucks on the highway where uh, they're being guided. They're efficiently running right close to one another. Uh, hopefully, we will no longer have to pull out and pass the, the truck that's doing 62. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Passing the truck yeah, because it'll be, it'll be an yeah. endless, endless well, line. It'll be like a train, <laughs> but it makes a true road it's, train. Exactly. Why, what's wrong with the train? I mean, why do you have to do that? Good question. Well, they do anyway. I mean, you know, this country runs on trucks mm. and, uh, and trains, too. But nonetheless, uh, they're just trying to figure out how to make it more efficient. Because, again, the number one complaint of every single trucking company in this country is they can't get drivers. Yeah. It's the hardest thing to get. And it's getting worse, not better. Yeah. So if you can have these, these platoons of trucks with one driver essentially driving four or five semis, mm. bingo, you've solved a lot of your driver problem. Well, you could end up with uh, a cab and a driver and a half a dozen powered trailers. Not even oh. complete trucks. Right? They're all linked together yeah. somehow, you know, with bogeys in between, but the whole thing is powered. So I think it, if, if there's a con consumer driver lobby, there's going to be a big outcry that how do I get around some yeah. guy with, you know, there's 10 trailers in a row. I, you Teamsters can't back. might weigh in on this, too. Yeah, that's, <laughs> good, that's a very good point, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. You need to hear from bureaucrats. So, so we, Ken, you joined us. What, what is your take on the ridge lines and sort of bring this full circle a little I'm bit I'm very here. impressed. I, I truly am. I, uh, my initial thought going in was that it's something of a wuss truck. And uh, where I live in Virginia, I mean, you have trucks, you know. I'm the only guy in the neighborhood who doesn't own a truck or a tractor. Uh, I wasn't prepared for how smooth, quiet, efficient, and uh, how good it is. I mean, it, it's, a tr it's something I would actually consider buying because you don't have to climb up Mount Everest to get inside it. You don't have that uh, undulation on uh, on even a smooth road that's so common with uh, with trucks. Uh, tons of fascinating features, including this tailgate uh, speaker. But it's it's the real deal. I just drove on the handling course and back-to-back uh, -back with Tacomas and, and uh, Colorados, and the Honda just buzzes around merrily, and the others bounce and jump and twist. So... Uh, I don't know. I don't think they're going to convince the guys who drive the big Fords and uh, and Chevys and Dodges unless gasoline goes up over $4 again. But for a lot of people, this vehicle makes sense. 
course, that could be the kiss of death when journalists say, oh, I love this car. I might even buy it. <laughs> every journalist, yeah. it's, it's, it's every call you own a Magnum, right? Yeah. Yes. Every journalist yeah. in the business it's loves space wagons. All the journalists, yeah, exactly. yeah that's, diesel, that's the point. Wagons diesel wagons with, with manual yeah. transmissions, right? right. right. Yeah. Yeah. We're living proof. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, we all love the things that nobody else wants to buy. <laughs> that's right. Hey, with that, we're going to have to wrap this up. But uh, Ken Gross, thanks for joining us Thank uh, on the show. Joe Philippi, Thank great you, having you here. And Gary, we ought to do this again in another week. We'll probably be inside a building, though. So. Yeah, we'll go back to the studio. Okay, everyone, thanks for having tuned in. Really appreciate it. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.